So I'm uh, delighted to be with you this evening, although I note that there are not 700 people in attendance. <laughs> I'll try not to take that personally. <laughs> How's that? So my aim, to, I'm going to talk for about, uh, I think about 20, 25 minutes, and as I understand, we want to the whole thing to go for an hour. So if I deliver on that, that should give us a pretty good amount of time to have uh, questions and, and discussion, which I suspect you will enjoy more than just listening to me. My aim is to persuade you that Donald Trump is not the problem. He's merely the symptom of several problems. And merely getting rid of the symptom, as many of our fellow citizens are keen to do, will leave the problem or the problems very much in place. And that, I fear, is what the ongoing commotion uh, to rid ourselves of Donald Trump is likely to yield. Now, if I were to deliver a homily this evening, I'd probably use the following as my introductory text. Fairly long quotation from somebody who I think we can safely say is a 20th century American prophet, James Baldwin. Back in 1955, James Baldwin wrote the following. In America, Life seems to move faster than anywhere else on the globe. And each generation is promised more than it will get, which creates in each generation a furious, bewildered rage, the rage of people who cannot find solid ground beneath their feet. Now my bet, maybe I'll be wrong, my bet is that assuming he avoids blundering into a major war, and that's a big assumption, but my bet is that assuming that he doesn't get us in a big war, that Donald Trump will turn out to be the least significant American president in recent memory. He will be what Millard Fillmore was to the 19th century, and Warren G. Harding to the 20th century. Now, to be sure, Trump has said and continues to say innumerable things that qualify as inane and reprehensible. And he has done more than a few things that are wrongheaded, but little in what he has said or done is irreversible, assuming, that is, that whoever ultimately succeeds him, whether that's sooner or later, governs with a modicum of competence and common sense. So I've been impressed that the gap between what Trump says and what he does is actually huge. He poses as a decisive and bold leader who will, of course, make America great again. Yes, yet his actions actually tend to be fairly small bore. In practice, he's proving to be kind of a Goldilocks president, choosing between not too hot and not too cold. And I think we've seen this again and again. For example, in the way that he has responded to or taken on issues related to trade, to NATO, Afghanistan, DACA. I think it's unlikely that he will ever rise to the level of mediocrity. <laughs> and therefore, he is not the danger 
He is not a danger to the republic, leading us down the path to fascism, as some people, I think, uh, to, rather too loosely uh, predict. So what then is the problem? What explains the rage of the people who, unable to find solid ground beneath their feet, out of despair, I think, express their unhappiness by electing Donald Trump president? So that's what I want to talk about for about the next 20 minutes or so. That is to say, how is it that someone like Trump could become president in the first place? Now, you may, many people do, blame sexism. They blame Fox News. They blame James Comey. They blame Russian meddling. They blame Hillary Clinton's failure to visit Wisconsin. <laughs> but I think you can, you, can, you can cite those factors, none of which are irrelevant. You can cite those factors all you want. But I think a more fundamental explanation is this. The presidential election of 2016 constituted a de facto referendum on the course of recent US history. And that referendum rendered a definitive judgment. The underlying consensus in forming basic US policy ever since the end of the Cold War has collapsed. Precepts that members of the policy elite have long treated as self-evident no longer command the backing or the assent of the American people. Put simply, it's the ideas, stupid. It's the ideas that let us down. So those who imagine that Trump's removal will put things right are deluding themselves. And to persist in thinking that, that he defines the problem, is to commit an error of the first order. Here's another quote. Without the Cold War, without the Cold War, what's the point of being an American? You know, as a long twilight struggle was winding down, Harry Rabbit Angstrom, the novelist John Updike's late 20th century everyman, Harry Rabbit Angstrom pondered that question. Without the Cold War, what's the point? And in short order, Rabbit got his answer. And so too did the rest of us, his fellow citizens, after only the most perfunctory consultation. Now, the passing of the Cold War offered cause for celebration. On that point, all agreed. Yet as it turned out, the passing of the Cold War did not require reflection did not receive any reflection from the public at large. Policy elites professed to have matters well in hand. The dawning of the new era, the post-Cold War era, they believed, summoned Americans not to think anew, not to have any regrets, not to perform any repentance, repentance, but it summoned them to keep doing precisely what they were accustomed to doing, albeit now without fretting further about communist takeovers or the risks of nuclear Armageddon. In a world where a single superpower, a sole superpower, was calling the shots, utopia seemed to wait just around the corner. All that was needed, policy elites concluded, was for the United States to demonstrate the requisite confidence and resolve. Three specific propositions comprised the elite consensus that coalesced during the initial decade of the post-Cold War era. According to the first of those propositions, the globalization of corporate capitalism held the key to wealth creation on a hitherto unimaginable scale. According to the second proposition, jettisoning norms derived from Judeo-Christian religious traditions held the key to the further expansion of, and indeed the perfection of, 
personal freedom. And according to the third proposition, muscular global leadership exercised by the United States held the key to promoting a stable and humane international order. So unfettered neoliberalism plus the unencumbered self plus unabashed American assertiveness. These define the elements of the post-Cold War consensus that formed during the first half of the 1990s. These plus what enthusiasts called the information revolution. The miracle of that so-called revolution, gathering momentum just as the Soviet Union was going down for the count, provided in a sense the secret sauce that infused the emerging consensus with a sense of historical inevitability. Now the Cold War, from the latter part of the 1940s through the 1980s. The Cold War had certainly fostered notable improvements in computational speed and capacity, in new modes of communication, in new techniques for storing, accessing, and manipulating information. Yet however impressive these developments, only as the Cold War receded did they move from the background to the forefront for true believers. And there were and are today many. For true believers, information technology served as, as sort of quasi-theological function, promising answers to life's ultimate questions. Although God might be dead, Americans found in Bill Gates and Steve Jobs nerdy, but nonetheless compelling idols. More immediately, in the eyes of the policy elite, the information revolution meshed with and reinforced the new policy consensus. For those focused on political economy, the information revolution greased the wheels of globalized capitalism, creating vast new opportunities for trade, and for investment. For those looking to shed constraints on personal freedom, information promised empowerment, making identity itself something to choose or to discard or to modify. For members of the national security apparatus, the information revolution seemed certain to endow the United States with seeming unassailable military capabilities. That these various enhancements would combine to improve the human condition was all but taken for granted. That they would in due course align everybody from Afghans to Zimbabweans with American values and the American way of life seemed more or less inevitable. The three presidents of the post-Cold War era, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama, put these several propositions to the test. Now our preference for politics as a sort of a form of theater requires us to pretend that our 42nd, 43rd, and 44th presidents differed in fundamental ways. In practice, however, their similarities greatly outweighed any of their differences. Taken together, the administrations over which they presided so we're talking the period from 1993 until uh, uh, this year. Taken together, the administrations over which they presided collaborated in pursuing a common agenda, each intent on proving that the post-Cold War consensus could work, even in the face of mounting evidence to the contrary. Now, to be fair, it did work for some. Globalization did make some people very rich indeed. In doing so, however, it greatly exacerbated inequality while doing nothing to alleviate the condition of the American working class and underclass. The emphasis on diversity and multiculturalism did improve the status of groups long subjected to discrimination. Yet those advances have done remarkably little 
to reduce the alienation and despair pervading a society suffering from an epidemic of chronic substance abuse, morbid obesity, teen suicide, and similar afflictions. Throw in the world's highest incarceration rate, a seemingly insatiable appetite for pornography, urban school systems stuck in permanent crisis, and mass shootings that occur with metronomic regularity, and what you have is something other than the profile of a healthy society. As for militarized American global leadership, it has indeed resulted in various bad actors like Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein meeting their richly deserved fates. Yet it, yet it has also embroiled the United States in a series of costly, senseless, unsuccessful, and ultimately counterproductive wars. As for the vaunted information re revolution, its, its impact, at least in my view, has been ambiguous at best. Even if those with eyeballs glued to their personal uh, electronic device can't tolerate being offline long enough to assess the actual costs of being perpetually connected. So in November of 2016, on election day, Americans who consider themselves ill-served by this post-Cold War consensus signaled that they had had enough. Voters who concluded that neoliberal economic policies, a culture taking its motto from the outback steakhouse chain, and a national security strategy that employs the US military as a global police force were not working to their benefit. Those are the people, in my view, who provided the crucial margin in the election of Donald Trump as president. The response of the political establishment, the establishment devoted to this post-war consensus, the response of that establishment to this extraordinary repudiation testifies to the extent of its own bankruptcy. The Republican Party still clings to the notion that reducing taxes, cutting government red tape, restricting abortion, curbing immigration, prohibiting flag burning, and increasing military spending will alleviate all that ails the country. But to judge by the promises contained in the recently unveiled and instantly forgotten program for a, quote, better deal, it was about six weeks ago, and you already don't know what I'm talking about, probably. <laughs> Democrats believe that raising the minimum wage, capping the cost of prescription drugs, and creating apprenticeship programs for the unemployed will return their party to the good graces of the American electorate. Not likely. My point is that in both parties, embarrassingly small bore thinking prevails with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party equally bereft of fresh ideas. Each party is, to put the matter bluntly, led by aging hacks. And neither party has identified an antidote to the crisis of American politics signified by the nomination and election of Donald Trump. So while our emperor famously tweets Rome itself fiddles. Now, I am, by temperament, a conservative and a traditionalist. I am wary of revolutionary movements that, more often than not, end up being hijacked by nefarious plotters who are more interested in satisfying their own ambitions than in pursuing high ideals. Yet even I am prepared to admit that the status quo appears untenable, and that incremental change will not suffice. The challenge of the moment is to embrace a form of radicalism without succumbing to irresponsibility. The one, the one good thing I think we can say about the election of Donald Trump is this, to borrow an image from Thomas Jefferson, it may well serve as a fire bell in the night. 
curing Americans once and for all from the illusion that from the White House comes redemption. I think that's the most insidious aspect of our politics and something that, is, that we can date back at least as, as far as Franklin Roosevelt. By now, we ought to have had enough of de facto monarchy. But by extension, Americans should also come to see as intolerable the meanness, corruption, and partisan dysfunction so much in evidence at the opposite end of Pennsylvania Avenue. We need not wax sentimental over the days when Lyndon Johnson and Everett Dirksen presided over the Senate. Some of the rest of you oldsters, people like me, know who those people were. <laughs> to conclude that Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer represent something other than progress. <laughs> if Congress continues to behave as contemptibly as it has in recent years and recent weeks, it will by default allow the conditions that produce Trump and his cronies to prevail. So it's time to take another stab at an approach to governance worthy of a democratic republic. Well, where to begin? I submit that Rabbit Angstrom question, Angstrom's question offers a place to start. What's the point of being an American? Now, there are many ways of answering Rabbit's query. And my own answer, however, is rooted in an abiding conviction that our problems are less quantitative than qualitative, rather than simply more more wealth, more freedom, more attempts at global leadership. The times call for different. In my view, the point of being an American is to participate in creating a society that strikes a balance between wants and needs, that exists in harmony with nature and the rest of humankind, and that is rooted in an agreed upon conception of the common good. Now, people of goodwill are likely to differ on how to fulfill such aspirations. But therein lies the basis for an interesting debate, one that is essential to prospects of stemming the accelerating decay of American civic life. Yet the beginning of wisdom lies in recognizing that Trump is not cause, but consequence. A post-Cold War consensus that promoted transnational corporate greed, that mistook libertinism for liberty, and that embraced militarized neo-imperialism as the essence of enlightened statecraft, all of that has created the conditions that handed him the presidency. And devising an alternative basis for US policy, I think, has now become an urgent priority. Thank you very much. In a different way than the corporations. I, I, think, I think we should, as long as the rest of the world will join us in that undertaking. And my sense is that the rest of the world will not. That, 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 that is to say that the people of um, Kenya uh, believe that, are, are, are devoted to advancing the well-being of, of Kenyans. Uh, and I suspect that that's pretty much the case of all peoples everywhere, collectively. There are, there are obviously virtuous and high-minded individuals in every society who are themselves self-sacrificing and who wish very much to see their fellow citizens to join in that enterprise. But you remember I said I'm a conservative and I'm a traditionalist. As I think at the end of the day, uh, regardless of country, regardless of the system of government, whether it's democratic or not democratic, the people who are governed look to those who govern them with an expectation that the people in charge are going to act in ways to advance the well-being of that society. 
And I don't see any way to get out of that. So we probably disagree on that point. So we can't be we the people anymore? Well, the we the people, I think, referred to we the people of the United States of America. It wasn't we the people of the globe or the universe. We should let somebody else ask the question now. Do you have cause for optimism? No, no. If I said anything that suggested optimism, <laughs> strike that, strike that. Holy cow. I thought I was speaking clearly. No, but, the, but, but see, the, but you know, you, you, are, you are raising a very specific uh, issue that I'm not sure it's at the core of everything, but by golly, it certainly is uh, a massively important contributing cause. And that's the influence of, of money in our election, which, which probably everybody in this room, to include me, absolutely decries. Uh, we had a, a, a Supreme Court decision uh, that uh, validated that practice, that in, in encouraged, reinforced that practice. And, uh, you know, God, you just, it's just uh, so depressing. It, it's going to require uh, another Supreme Court decision, or I suppose a constitutional amendment, which is difficult to do, uh, in order to fix the problem, that, that specific problem. And yet that specific problem is one that... Uh, uh, poses such an obstacle uh, to serious political reform that um, it's, it's, a, it's a cause that people need to not give up on, even though there's not a heck of a lot of uh, reason for you know, in, encouragement uh, that it's going to be fixed anytime soon. That's a big deal. But I mean, you know, okay, that's part of, uh, somebody's going to ask a question about the military industrial complex, uh, which also exists. No, it doesn't pull every little string but clearly uh, wields significant influence in the, in the halls of, of, of Congress, contributes to bad governance, contributes to the unwillingness to acknowledge the costs and, and failures of our war. Got to do something about that too. Uh, so I think that there, there, ends up, there ends up being a laundry list of problems that each, each formidable. I mean, it's, Ike warned us about the military industrial complex in January of 1961, for God's sakes. Uh, and it's still the problem that he identified uh, at that time. Uh, this is why it's such a difficult thing. I, mean, I think the burden of the presentation I have tried to make is to argue that uh, setting aside, not, not setting aside in the sense of ignoring, but, but, but setting aside these institutional uh, problems. There's a second category, I think, and that is what are the fundamental ideas to which our society subscribes, or to which at least the people who influence policy appear to subscribe? Uh, and, and I have come to believe that the, the place to begin a serious reform movement is to recognize that the ideas that have shaped American society, in particular since the end of the Cold War, are deeply flawed. And that even today, their flaws are not properly uh, recognized. And so we've got to press home the defects in the sense of, 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 of hammering away at their existence and calling the attention of the interested public to how they have failed, because that's a pre prerequisite, I think, to replacing them with something that might be more enlightened and more uh, effective. Well, of course it is. Uh, and, and, you know, that's right up there with the military-industrial complex and, 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 you know, it's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, my view, I've said in, in print, not that it matters, but I mean, I wish we had, wishing doesn't do any good, we, I wish we had a principled, progressive policy or party and a principled, conservative party. 
I would subscribe to the principled conservative party, probably. But my real point is if we had two principled parties, they might have a really interesting debate. <laughs> what we have is parties that are deeply corrupt, corrupted by money, uh, corrupted by politicians who, who, who certainly appear, with certain exceptions, who, who certainly appear to be motivated primarily by doing whatever is necessary to ensure their continuation in, in office, right? so that we don't have the kind of debate between liberal or progressive principles and conservative principles that arguably might yield more enlightened policies. So yeah, we need to have a new party, and uh, if you're gonna ask me, then what's my five-point plan for creating one? I don't have a five-point plan. I mean, because the history of our country, sadly, uh, is that uh, third-party movements tend to uh, appear, flame out, have minimal impact. Why is that? Well, because the two main parties have a profound interest in maintaining this duopoly of power. Uh, and they're not interested in forfeiting that system. Uh, yet another obstacle that we confront. Well, I don't know if it was essential to the post-war consensus. In my judgment, one of the characteristics of the post-Cold War period and of the policies, the, the, way, the way policies have unfolded, I see them as, as abandoning the traditional sources of moral norms. Now, you might say, some of you might say, good, I'm not a Jew, I'm not a Christian, I don't believe all that crap, uh, and, 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 and I would say, okay, then what ought to be the source of norms? What, 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 what ought to be the code to which we can collectively subscribe that governs human behavior. And my argument would be, we need to have one. Because I'm a, because I'm a traditionalist and I'm a conservative, I kind of like the one that we used to have. Although I have to say, as a, as a, as a sort of a, a observer of the scene, I know that my side has decisively lost the culture wars. Absolutely decisive. We've been banished from the field. I accept that. But what I don't accept is, with my side having lost a culture war, that therefore there, there should not be some prescription. And it gets, you know what it gets down to? It gets, it, it gets the, what we all believe in as Americans is freedom. What is the definition of freedom today? I mean, it needs to be something more than I can do what I want and you can do what you want. That, that's, that's just sort of atomistic. There, there need, there need, I made a quick reference in the talk to, to the common good. When I was a kid growing up, going to parochial schools, I didn't understand what the nuns were saying half the time, but, but one of the things they, one of, the, one of the, the, the bits of language, the concepts that were thrown out, was that phrase, the common good. I don't think it's even discussed much any longer and there certainly is no prevailing, in my judgment at least, there is no prevailing definition of what that common good would, ought to be. And, 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 a, and, a, and a definition of the common good that, uh, that connects to our belief that we are the freedom people. We believe we are the freedom people basically since the founding of the republic. Has to be a definition of the common good that says this is what freedom allows. This is what freedom requires. This is what freedom prohibits. And, the, and, and the, that, that set of assertions is something that we all choose to buy into. And I don't, I don't think we have that. I think it's gone. And I think that's part of the problem. Now, the fact that it's gone, it, it wasn't that, it certainly wasn't The people like, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama stood behind a podium and said, I hereby dismiss these traditional notions of what freedom permits, what freedom requires, and so on. As a, as a practical matter, 
our presidents have tended to pay lip service to these traditional notions. You know, they all tell us, uh, you know, God bless America, right? But, it, but as a practical matter, and I think especially since the end of the Cold War, they have tended to uh, uh, choose not to engage in a serious conversation about the course of the culture. What they've done, what they've done is to stick their noses into the culture war in ways that are, they believe to be consistent with their, their, their partisan interests. So, so we have Democrats who will be supportive of gay rights. We have Republicans who will purport to be pro-lifers. I may be too cynical, but I think on both sides, most of that is simply posturing. That they actually have very little serious interest in trying to shape the, the, the direction of the culture in a way that will help to uh, uh, restore a definition of the common good to which we can all subscribe. Please repeat the question. <laughs> it was a statement. It was a statement, I think. Good statement. You want, you want to try to repeat? No, I mean, because I'm not going to make any judgments about differences in genders. You can. You can say men are like this and women are like that. I am not going to say men are like this and women are like that. No, 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 no. I said she exaggerates to make her point. Yes, you did say that. She did say that. Okay. And I'm still not going to enter into that. Uh, <laughs> call it cowardice. Mm. Well, I've been out of the army longer than I was in the army, so I really don't consider myself a military person. But I have views on what you just the issue you raised, and I think that uh, it's a very good issue. I mean that uh, you, it, the Congress has forfeited, for, as a practical matter, uh, its uh, constitutional abrogated its constitutional responsibility to declare war. This occurred, it. and we allowed it, and this occurred over a period of several decades. There was an argument to be made uh, that the circumstances of the Cold War required the empowerment of the president to make decisions on the use of force. Um, of course, the Cold War's been over now for three and a half decades, and the president continues to exercise that authority. Now, there is, there is a certain amount of... of uh, I wouldn't say action, discussion in Congress uh, suggesting that maybe this isn't such a good idea. You'll note that there, is a, there are proposals, for example, to, uh, for Congress to uh, uh, enact a new authorization to use military force, AUMF. Everything that we do in the world in fighting wars between Afghanistan and uh, Iraq and Syria and Yemen, and Somalia, and Niger, and all these other places, the nominal justification is the, the declaration that the Congress passed, I think it was like 48 hours after 9-11. And that was a declaration that said, we, we hereby charge the president to do whatever he needs to do to make sure that, that this doesn't happen again. And that, that has been sort of stretched beyond recognition. Some people recognize that. Uh, whether or not they're gonna, the Congress is going to do anything about it is another question. We also have a, a, a awareness. This is directly attributable to the fact that uh, Trump is the president. That you know, really, maybe it doesn't make sense to have one human being yeah. have the authorization to launch a nuclear strike. It's insane. That that. There, again, during the Cold War, you can construct an argument that says that that may have been necessary, but we're not in that era anymore. Now, whether or not anything will be done, uh, again, whether there will be action that will respond to the problem that has been recognized, I really don't know. But those are problems, or issues, I should say, 
the demand attention and demand action as a way to begin not only restricting the prerogatives of the, of the chief executive, which I think that needs to be done, but there are also those are ways to begin backing away from or extracting ourselves from the situation in which we've gotten ourselves, whereby war is normal. Uh, used to be abnormal. Now it's become normal. Uh, and, and, and there are certain specific actions that could be taken that, to, that will begin to back us out of that, and, and those would be good things. We're not going to make everything hunky-dory, but I mean, there would be useful initiatives, I think. I'm not sure I understood what you just said. And I wonder if you could just yeah. frame it as a question. Help, Help me. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say it in another way, too, because part of what to say Trump is attempting, but he also is, is um, talking to people in ways that's polarizing. So therefore, he's kind of also an instigator of this same issue. I agree. So yeah. in other words, we can be in for more of a crisis if we don't somehow crack through that. I agree with that, too. So I watched, I, I, I checked out the Baldwin documentary out of our library three weeks ago. And uh, it's pretty good. I have to say it wasn't as good as I thought from reading the reviews. But it's very much worth, uh, worth watching. And I had just uh, been reading some Baldwin as well. When I'm 70 years old, I've just discovered James Baldwin. And one of the, one of the themes, uh, at least in my reading of him, one of the themes that he keeps coming back to hammers away at over, 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 and over again uh, is the unwillingness of, of white people, his fellow citizens, to, to, to see the reality in front of their faces. That, 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 that from his point of view, uh, African Americans know what's going on because they have been part of a system that is riddled with contradictions. And they can see those, because they experience them. In contrast, says James Baldwin, the white population, which, which has tended to, to enjoy privileges, obviously as poor whites and unprivileged whites, but has tended to enjoy privileges, cannot see. Uh, and I do think that that's still the case today. So that if we would probably somewhat unfairly characterize the average Trump voter as uh, a part of the white working class, uh, it's you know, it's not unreasonable for them to think they've been screwed lately. It's not unreasonable. And in that sense, their anger has some basis in justification. And, and in that sense, to go back to my Baldwin quote, by 2016, they found themselves with no place to stand. And they were also, as the Baldwin quote suggests, they were raised up to believe that they're going to get more. It's going to be better. And it's not, and, and, but that said, it also seems, and certainly we see this most clearly in the alt-right, white nationalist, you know, neo-Nazi uh, segment, which, which I have to say I don't take as a serious threat because I don't think there's that many of them. But nonetheless, they, are, they, are, they sure the hell command a lot of attention. And they, they I think, manifest the continuing inability of whites to, uh, more narrowly, white males, to, to see the reality of, of American history and the American condition. I'm right, in this book I'm working on right now, uh, my point of departure is a, a wonderful movie from 1946 that at least some of you will recall. 
And that's the best years of our lives. Big Oscar winner in 1946. No, not Jimmy Stewart. It's, a, it's a, uh, uh, Dana Andrews, uh, the young man who lost his uh, hands. Russell, Harold Russell, and uh, the guy who plays Myrna Loy's uh, uh, Powell. William Powell. Thank you. Okay. So these are these are three vets that come back from the war. They're all they all struggle. They all have. We, it's not called it in the in the movie, but they all have PTSD. And they all have challenges of readjusting. They all bond together. They didn't serve together during the war, but they come home to Boone City and they all bond together because they have this shared experience. They're all helped by good women who, as that's the role of Myrna Loy and the other gals to, you know, help the guy. Get his and and I, I'd, I'd watched this movie as a kid, even as an adult, many times, but it was only when I began working on this book and working on the book in the context of Trump, actually working on the book in the context of reading James Baldwin, that I said to myself, they're all white guys. Al, Fred, and Homer, they're all white guys. Matter of fact, Boone City, which apparently is modeled after Cincinnati, the Boone City in the movie is, I don't believe there is a single person of color in the entire movie. So it, it is three white males in white America. And we are shown and asked to empathize with, and I do empathize with, the, the challenges of readjusting to civilian life after the war. But they, I think, the movie in a sense, I now realize, is part of the phenomenon that we're talking about. You know, all they want is, to go, is for things to go back to where they were before they went in the service. All they want is to return to a traditional America, albeit one in which the Depression will become a bad dream. And I think that there's still a lot of, particularly white males in our country, who have exactly that same frame, frame of mind. And they believe that that's what they did. And Al, Fred, and Homer believed that that's what they were owed when they came home. And, and, and frankly, by and large, that's what the country told them. This is what you're owed. So, I mean, this gets into a whole different issue here, and that's the issue of how, how to overcome this deeply inbred absence of self-awareness. And uh, I, I not only don't know, but, but I mean, I'll admit that I don't know because I'm, I'm forced to admit that I myself, to the extent that I have any self-awareness today, it's been a long time coming. Uh, but that's, that, is, that ends up being a part of the problem. Beats me. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, here's another one of these issues. We have a military system, by which I mean the principles to which we adhere in deciding who will serve and under what terms. We have a military system that, we, that goes by the shorthand, the all-volunteer force. And Again, there's a reasonable story you can tell about why the all-volunteer force uh, was created at the end of the Vietnam War. Basically, the American people had chosen to abandon the tradition of the citizen soldier to which we had adhered throughout our history up to that point. American people said, done with citizen soldier. And Nixon basically ratified that informal decision by ending the collapsing system of conscription and inaugurating, with the congression, congressional approval, uh, this system that we have today. And at the time, uh, many people applauded. I'll bet you at the time, 
When was this organization founded? What year? Long. Well, let's see, during, during the, uh, during the uh, freeze, right? During the, we wanted to, we started, Did it exist we during Vietnam? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah. then I'll bet you members of this organization, when Nixon en ended conscription, I'll bet you members of this organization said, yay, that's a victory for our side. Uh, but uh, it turns out not to be a victory. It turns out that we have uh, created, and we choose to sustain a military system that's not democratic, uh, that helps to uh, allow people in positions of authority to use force in ways that are counterproductive. And, you know, frankly, not too many people really care all that much. I mean, if they cared, we probably would have 700 people here, like you had for Noam Chomsky. I'm not raising that again, because I feel badly. Uh, but I'm just, you know, sort of, just sort of noting uh, that the crowd's a little thin. Uh, so, so, yeah, so we, 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 are, we are a nation permanently at war in which the vast majority of our fellow citizens have no engagement, involvement in uh, that, that reality. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've written books uh, trying to point out the deficiencies of our military system, and uh, it's gotten, the issue's gotten very little attention. Why has it gotten little attention? Because the vast majority of our fellow citizens kind of like it that they don't have any obligation, they don't have any skin in the game. The military kind of likes it. The political establishment kind of likes it this military system. And so it goes on and on. Because the irony of the thing, of course, is the system doesn't, even if you set aside the fact that it's not democratic, it doesn't work. I mean, that is to say, the purpose of going to war is to achieve in a conclusive way your political objectives. And the political objectives might be uh, justifiable. They may be evil. But the object of going to war is to achieve your political purposes in a conclusive way, preferably expeditiously. Where are we? Jeez, we're in a sixth, we're, hit, we're into the 17th year of the war in Afghanistan. How can that possibly, and, and, and how many people care? Well, <laughs> not many. So, so the military system that we have, I think, is another part of the problem here. This is a problem with many dimensions, as you can tell. Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem is not the warheads that we built during the Cold War. Uh, we have, we have uh, what's, what's the term of art? Not dismant maybe it's dismantled. I think it's dismantled. I think roughly two-thirds of the arsenal. At least. Uh, so the number of warheads is now much, much smaller. Number of bombers is smaller. Number of land-based missiles is smaller. The problem is that President Obama approved a modernization program of our nuclear arsenal that is, that is estimated to cost a trillion dollars over the course of the 30 years that it's going to take to build new bombers, new submarines, new missiles, and new warheads. And if you're looking for uh, an example of, of the challenges that you all, as a peace group, face, it's to acknowledge that when the president made that decision, it got like this much attention. Bare acknowledgment. And you say, how can that be? I don't know how that can be. But that's, that's the problem. It's a trillion dollar modernization program, I think. Uh, you all. You all come up with a half million dollars and donate it to Senator Collins or whoever, and you'll find that your money talks uh, just as well as does the money of General Dynamics and, you know, what's, the, what's our big contractor in Massachusetts? Raytheon. 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 Because cause they're all on the take, right? Uh, and, uh, and they are attentive. Uh, they're, they're determined to stay in office. In order to stay in office, they've got to have uh, campaign money. Uh, and so they are corruptible, if you want to put it in the bluntest terms. 
You're starting to wear me out, I gotta admit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I'll take, let's take three more, then we'll give you a little break, and we can stay, right? You can stay a little while too. Uh, I was hoping to answer to that question. I share your concerns. Uh, it is, uh, you know, one of the interesting things, I think, about our uh, perpet the, the perpetual wars in which we find ourselves engaged in Iraq and Afghanistan and Somalia and Yemen and so on is that uh, it has the effect of distracting attention from other problems that can justifiably be called security threats. Climate change is a security threat. Uh, climate change gets a certain amount of discussion in our country. Uh, climate change gets at least, at least some lip service uh, from government at various levels. But it certainly isn't treated as an urgent uh, issue. Uh, certainly doesn't get the amount of money that the Pentagon gets in order to continue uh, the maintain the posture that we have. So uh, how, how do we change that? Well, I mean, that, that's your very good question, and I don't know. Obviously, we have to get different people in Congress that have a different set of priorities uh, that might uh, take a longer view of things and recognize that, guess what? The Taliban actually doesn't pose a threat to our well-being. But recurring hurricanes and floods and fires uh, just might. Uh, you know, uh, all we can do is keep hammering on the table and screaming and shouting. Hope somebody notices. And it seems to be responsible for Africa. Uh, and there has been, when you, when you go home, uh, look up Nick Terse, T-U-R-S-E. Nick is a journalist who has been all over the AFRICOM story, who's been publishing articles, particularly in Tom Dispatch, but he also read a book uh, that has tracked uh, the expansion of AFRICOM's presence in Africa and also the expansion of its, of its, of its uh, mandate. When AFRICOM was created, uh, the idea was it's not, a, it's not a combat organization. It's just kind of helping out local security forces, you know, helping them embrace democratic norms. It's all sound very sort of innocent, but it's turned out to be it's a warfighting organization. Uh, and so I don't think that we actually quite know yet uh, what those uh, troops were doing in Niger that got ambushed, uh, but they're engaged in what is de facto combat operations. So the information's out there. Uh, not many of us are paying attention. Uh, and certainly the Congress is not. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that even members of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Lindsey Graham as an example, after the Niger incident, says publicly, gosh, I didn't know we had 800 troops in Niger. So, so it's not simply that you and I going about our daily business, may not be keeping track of this, but a senator on the Senate Armed Services Committee sure the hell ought to be paying attention, and then they also profess to be uh, out of the loop, which is a problem.